Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer Capital. And joining me today is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Officer. And on today's webcast, we will provide you with a brief macro overview. And of course, at the tail end of the conversation, David would be pleased to address your questions. You can uh, ask those questions via the Q&A or the chat on the Zoom link. And with that, I turn the conversation over to the one and only David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hey, Pamela. How are you? Great. Thank you. Nice to see you. I want to welcome everybody on uh, beginning of April. Doesn't feel like it outside yet, but I'm sure it's coming. Uh, I got taken advantage of yesterday morning on Twitter. I saw that Novak Djokovic had agreed to take on Roger Federer as his coach. It took me about five minutes to realize it was April 1st. And uh, so the jokes were yesterday. Uh, we got some stuff to talk about in the market today. So um, lots going on. Uh, markets had a very, very strong start to the year. Uh, we're into April now, new quarter. Uh, and so uh, we're going to take things kind of from the top down. Uh, as always, we're kind of watching for what's changing, what's staying the same. There's always small nuances that we want to pick up on because at the end of the day, all of the pieces ultimately fit together. The market is like a, a giant quilt uh, and the small subtle changes are, are worth picking up on uh, before you're reading about them in the newspaper. So just, just from the top, as, as people know, we, we think we're in a structural bull market in equities that started in the U S in 2013. It's been ongoing with a series of interruptions. When we look at the last two structural bull markets, we can see there were, you know, corrections in time like 1990, 91 or corrections in price, like the very sharp sell off in 1987, October, uh, or in uh, the fall of, sorry, the early part of 2020 and the COVID sell-off. But the net of it is when we get beyond these cyclical bear markets, uh, it's onward and upward. And it tends to be to get two to three good years in front of you. We're about three months into making new highs. Uh, and uh, the S&P is marching its way higher. Uh, when we look at the last, <clears throat> um, last two years, this is the beginning of the sell-off in 2022, the October 22 low, um, and then a series of higher lows. We had the last big test in October, as we often do. Uh, and you can see that really the market has been on rails since then. Now, that's, that's for a number of different reasons. First of all, the market started to look beyond the Fed's tightening cycle. Second, uh, economic data has stayed relatively strong and earnings have stayed relatively strong given the significance of the uh, central bank tightening around the world. Also, investor positioning has been probably wrong-footed. People were big sellers of stocks all the way through 2023 and in fact find themselves on the outside looking in. Uh, and so you can see that every time we get these little pullbacks, you know, buyers have a tendency to step in. So we're in this channel, the breadth models that we follow turned higher uh, in the end of October. They've broadly been positive since then. Uh, and, you know, it's it's positive until it isn't. But of course, you know, not everything works at the same time. Lots of sectors uh, not participating in this rally. We'll talk a little bit about that today. And we can get corrections at any time. So not to say that we don't think that we'll ever get a correction again. We certainly will. You know, we have a tendency to see as many as seven, three percent pullbacks over the course of a year, as many as three, five percent pullbacks over the course of the year. You know, you often get a 10 percent pullback over the course of the year. My guess is that's less likely in this year, given the strength of the last five months. It tends to be when you get, you know, pretty consistent strength, November, December, January, February. If we take all the occurrences back to 1950 uh, and, and look at what came next. You know, you had some small pullbacks in the month of April. Uh, you know, we're down today. Uh, S&P was down about oh, 60, 70 basis points. At one point, it was down about 1.2. NASDAQ was down about 90 basis points. Uh, the Dow was down 97 basis points or 1%. So that's in line with, you know, what, what sort of happens in April. I mean, it can always be more than that. But uh, April has been positive 82% of the time when you had that strong five-month run. Q2 in general was positive with some very small negative outliers. But the final nine months of the year was positive uh, every single occurrence, an average of 11.9%, the median of 11.2. So that's versus uh, what is typical, 73% of the time being positive up an average of 7%. 
Uh, so as we head into this period, you know, our models have been pretty supportive, showing that there is resiliency in the market. Um, so to, to move forward, uh, you know, um, we do know that the U.S. markets have significantly outperformed the rest of the world over the last really 15 years. Uh, and we know that uh, there's been some big buyers. Um, biggest buyers in the market have been corporations buying back their own shares. Part of that, though, we have to remember was driven by the fact that interest rates were exceedingly low, meaning that they could fund themselves with very cheap debt, selling corporate debt and buying back shares. Um, that's probably less likely going forward, although lots of companies generating lots of cash. Foreign investors, because foreign, foreign markets were significantly weaker than the US, have been significant buyers buying $1.8 trillion with the US stock since the year 2000. And then of course, households have been putting money to work. Mutual funds and pension funds actually, you know, rotated money away. They've been missing out on some of these strong markets. Um, but, you know, we have had some big buyers uh, that may not all be there as we go forward. So we're always cognizant of what can change. Higher rates can make it less likely that some corporations take on debt to buy their shares. Uh, if foreign markets are doing a little bit better, foreign investors may, you know, take some money back to their own market. Japan might be a good example of that. Um, even though uh, U.S. stocks, you know, have been more expensive than the rest of the world, I want to highlight, and I did last week, you know, at market highs uh, in 1970, the, the most expensive stocks traded at a four, uh, 35 times multiple with a 10% profit margin. In 2000, the biggest names that everybody had focused on in the late part of uh, the 1990s were trading at 42 times earnings with an 11% net margin. Today, the companies that we talk about as being the most popular and most broadly owned, are trading at 26 times, a significant discount to those other two occasions, generating profit margins, you know, close to 30%. So I don't want for a minute to say we don't think that U.S. stocks are attractive, but we have talked about the fact that other parts of the world are less expensive, right? Global multiple minus U.S. forward earnings multiples, you know, it's as big a discount as we've seen going back to 2005. And when we add uh, emerging markets in there. Again, emerging market stocks traded a valuation discount of about 43% relative to the U.S. benchmark. Now, part of that's for good reason. You know, there's very high quality companies in the U.S. Part of it has to do with the sectors that make up these markets. We've talked a little bit about that. But the net of it is we think that after many, many years of underperformance, some global markets look really attractive. And, you know, we've, we've had some benefit from this. The Japanese market really gapping its way higher. Uh, India performing particularly well. Europe making new highs for the first time since 2007. Uh, and Mexico as well. So let's break down the, the earnings multiples and the, and the changes. We look at the U.S. U.S. current P.E. is just a little over 21 times. Uh, the uh, expected earnings growth of the next 12 months is about 7%. Japan trading at 16 times, expecting earnings growth over the next 12 months at 12%. So that's kind of interesting. We are seeing PE expansion everywhere in the world, right? PE up since to the October of 22 low. That's what happens in a bull market. You get earnings growth, plus you get multiple expansion, and that's how you really make, make money. Um, and, and that is what's happening. So we're, we're in a bull market around the world. Uh, some markets better than others for sure. But the other thing that's interesting is when we look at the MSCI All World Index, XUS, when we look at the makeups, financials 21% of the total, industrials 14%, you know, energy 5.5%, much bigger than the S&P, and materials 7.3%. These sectors we've talked about in these webcasts are sectors that have been performing particularly well, and they do make up a bigger part of the global universe. And when we look at the TSX, which really topped out in 2008 and didn't really start making sustained new highs until 2021, you know, a long time, 14, 15 years, when we look at our, our makeup, you know, S&P TSX energy, 17% of the index, financials, 31% of the index, industrials, 14% of the index and materials, 11%. So you can understand why the Canadian market's acting better 
than it has for many years. These sectors are sectors that were out of favor for a long period of time. They're relatively inexpensive, relatively under-owned, and they're starting to perform, right? So this is an important dynamic we have to take into account when we're making our investments. And it's one of the reasons why we think that the MSCI All World Index XUS outside the US can perform alongside the US as, an, as a strong proxy for global investing. And this is why we use this as the benchmark for the new uh, global equity fund that we launched in December. When we look at fixed income, uh, you know, we continue to believe we saw a generational low in 2020. And this is interest rates on the 10 year bond from uh, 1981 through 2020. You'll notice, I mean, everybody wants to fade this uh, and buy the dips and bonds. And you've seen these higher highs and higher lows and yields. It's not really worked for bond investors to try to buy the dips as it had, you know, really for 30 years. People have muscle memory. And when, when yields would, would, uh, would rally, they'd buy bonds and then yields would come down again. Rally, yields would rally, they'd buy bonds and yields come down again. It was a very profitable trade, not working so well now. If we look at the TLT, which is the ETF that holds long-term U.S. Treasury bonds, then when TLT was at its high, it was at $180. So $180 trading today at $91. It's about a 50% drop in price. Now they've been getting yield along the way, but not enough to offset that decline. So as we've said, as long as these moving averages continue to trend lower, as long as we continue to make lower highs, you have to assume actually rallies in the bond market are worth selling, not buying. And that's a really important dynamic in a world where people think it's important to have kind of like 50% in bonds and 50% in stocks. There's no return now for the last four years in the U.S. bond market. Stocks versus bonds since the bottom of the rates, stocks outperforming steadily, even through the bear market in 2022. We don't see any change taking place there. When we look at <clears throat> the types of uh, equities that income investors want to own during rising rates, we've talked a lot about over the last couple of years owning dividend growers. In fact, Amit Joshi, one of our portfolio managers just on BNN this afternoon, explaining why we think that energy companies that pay dividends are much more attractive to own currently than telecom stocks. Telecom stocks have a higher dividend, but there's certainly no growth and lots of price competition. Energy companies are generating tons of cash. Their cash flow rises as energy prices are going up, and they're many of them raising their dividend 20% a year. So RDVY, which is the dividend growth ETF, continues to outperform the aggregate bond index. So this is growing stream of cash flow versus a fixed stream of interest. This is what we think investors need and want to own. Um, again, going back to this long-term uh, uh, interest rate chart, I think it's really important to highlight. We've all seen these charts that showed every time rates went up over the last 40 years, eventually the Fed broke something and forced them to drop rates aggressively. We came into this year, people expecting the Fed to be quite, um, quite uh, consistent in lowering rates over the course of the year. The expectation was as many as eight rate cuts over the course of the year. Now, there is some question actually whether there will be a rate cut. Now, in the period from 1951 to 1966, rates went higher. There were no crises. The economy handled it quite well. Stocks went up 15% a year. And the, the economy was in a position to handle higher rates. Now, I think the data that came out over the last week is really, really interesting. When we look at the conference board's leading economic indicators, since the late part of 2021, they have been coming in below zero steadily. Now, this is through a period where we saw consistent rising interest rates and consistently heard calls for a recession. But we just had the first positive number going back to 2022. In other words, the leading indicators are getting better despite the fact interest rates haven't been cut. Another piece of data we got this week, the ISM manufacturing new orders. 
they had been below 50, meaning contraction, for 16 months. Now look at all the other times you had multiple months of contraction in the ISM manufacturing data. They all happened and eventually stopped when the Fed started to cut rates and you were coming out of a recession. Well, unless they wind up looking backwards and saying we were in a recession, the Fed has never cut rates when after a long period of time of negative ISM manufacturing data, data turned positive, which it did this week. So the economy appears to be far more resilient than people had expected. We talked last week about rising earnings estimates. When we look at commodities, commodities bottomed in 2020 after falling in some cases from 2008 until 2020. You know, we talked about the fact that eventually we'd start looking beyond the Fed tightening, which, of course, we are. This is the last number of months. And so commodities have marched higher over the last two months. In fact, <clears throat> outperforming stocks and outperforming bonds. So we've focused on owning reflationary assets, assets that do well in a period where the economy is a little bit more robust where rates are a little bit higher, the cost of living is going up, and we want to own companies that have an ability to generate cash and aren't hurt by rising rates. So one of those reflationary assets is gold. We highlighted over the last little while. This is 2012 through 2020, a sideways consolidation while the Fed was tightening rates. And look at the last two months blasting off. This is the beginning of April in the first couple of days. I think this is really, really significant. The last time we had this same kind of price pattern was from 1996 through 2000, uh, 2006, where gold fell as low as $250 an ounce. I can tell you, I was in the in the business at the time. You know, people believed that gold was a relic, would never be of any value again. Ultimately, when it started moving higher, it started moving higher from about $400 an ounce. And by the time it was done, it was $1,900. So I think there is extreme pessimism. Even people who joke about the fact that some people are invested in gold today. Uh, but I, I wouldn't laugh too hard. I think that this is a pretty positive technical setup. And um, it's not being driven by North Americans. It's being driven overseas. China has been a very significant buyer of, of gold, as have other currencies who don't want to be in the reach of the U.S. Treasury. Uh, and and um, uh, individual investors in Asia have been very significant buyers of gold. Now, often when gold rallies, you get you get oh, this is supposed to say silver. Silver start to rally as well. Something I've been watching for. Uh, and this is just the most recent uh, sort of 12 years. But uh, this month, we're breaking out of this range in silver as well. So silver and gold looking quite interesting. Beyond that, oh, well, again, this is supposed to say copper. Well, my apologies for the editing. Copper uh, clearly breaking out of consolidation. Uh, agricultural commodities have started to take off again. I think that that's really important. Uh, and when we look at in the last month, where the big returns were in all the various sectors and asset class, gold miners up 20%, oil service up 13, oil and gas producers up 10, energy sector up 9.6, home builders we've talked about, metals and mining up 6.7, agriculture up 6.5, semiconductors up 6, all quite economically sensitive groups, banks up 6%. Semiconductors up 28% so far in the year. Now, at the other end of the spectrum, we have things like biotech, sort of high multiple technology, things that are hurt by rising rates, software, consumer discretionary, telecom, and so on. So things are going pretty well uh, since the middle of March uh, last year. The equally weighted S&P is up 24%. The TSX up 18 uh, The bond market up 1.2%. Uh, so for those folks that thought, well, rates are higher, I better buy bonds, not, not working out so well. Our income strategy is up 24.75%, equity strategy is up 31.7%, uh, and our global macro strategy up 30%. Um, so there are some real haves and have-nots. In the global markets, the MSCI All World Index since the beginning of the year up 4.2%. Uh, the new fund we launched at the end of December is up about 8 Again, um, you know, getting to the right places, I think, is, is making a real big difference. 
Um, Bitcoin. Bitcoin pulled back a little bit today. I just want to put it in context. This is the long-term chart. Really, um, it's not much of a pullback. If we look at how it's performing relative to stocks, anytime Bitcoin turned higher relative to the equal weight, like in 2016, you got a long period of outperformance. It happened in 2020, and it looks like it happened uh, in the fall of last year and, and looks as though maybe there's a little room to run there. So, uh, you know, not... Not a Bitcoin maximalist, but I do believe that it probably has a place in portfolios. We have about a, a, an 11% stake in our global macro portfolio. So uh, we don't have to be everywhere. Our job is to try to identify those pockets of strength areas that are being revalued where multiples are expanding. Um, we, we always watch for change, new areas of leadership to emerge or old leadership to, to wane. And we try and talk about those things uh, transparently in, in this weekly call. And in the event that we see our breadth model start to deteriorate, you know, we got to be willing to play defense or exit big parts of the market or put some cash on the sidelines. You know, so it is a tactical strategy. We think that a big part of investing is getting to the right neighborhood. In other words, focusing on the right asset classes right now, like equities uh, and commodities. Uh, and then finding the right neighborhoods within those asset classes, sectors or themes that are benefiting from some structural shift. Uh, but 30% of, of return comes from finding specific securities to use in those areas to express your view. So we use our top-down work to identify where our neighborhoods should be focused. We do use our bottom-up security selection, trying to find securities that are good getting better uh, both technically and fundamentally. And then our portfolio is a, a combination of those two things. And then we have to pair that portfolio from time to time using our selling process, which is aimed at making sure little mistakes don't turn into big ones or that we protect gains uh, once we have them. We're always looking for areas where breadth or the percentage of stocks performing well is expanding. And we want to avoid areas where we're seeing contraction so with that all being said, uh, as we sit today, <clears throat> around the world, really, the indicators are quite positive. The short-term indicators, uh, percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average, percent of stocks trading with positive weekly price momentum or upward trajectory, the percent of stocks making new all-time highs versus those making new all-time lows, and the percent of stocks trading above their 30-week moving average or 150-day moving average. All of these indicators have been showing broadening, meaning a higher and higher percent of stocks are trading above their long-term moving average, a higher and higher number of stocks are making new highs versus the ones making new lows. The percent of stocks with positive uh, upward trajectory is expanding, and the percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average moving higher. When we look at the percent of stocks in long-term uptrends in the NYSE, it's 66% of stocks. So two thirds of companies in the NYSE are performing well. That's a healthy market. It means that even if you were throwing darts, you're likely to find a stock that's going up in price. That number can get to 75 or 80% and stay there for an extended period in a bull market, which is why we wanna be invested in a bull market. Um, the percent of stocks in uptrends globally pulled back a little in the month of uh, March, although it's within a whisper of reversing back higher again, it takes a 6% reversal higher. So we would say that the breadth in the market is very healthy. It's not a narrow market. It's not a market where only a few stocks are doing well. We don't have to be concentrated in technology. There's lots of things to do. So let's talk about that. Uh, I, I magnified these charts a little bit this week uh, to look really just at the last sort of 18 months. We can see that the relative price strength for the financial sector, this is the XLF ETF, has been rising steadily, showing no sign of deterioration, trading above all the rising moving averages. This includes insurance companies, holdings that we have. We've talked about Fairfax uh, in Canada. Progressive is one that continues to act really, really well trading better than 93% of stocks in the S&P over the course of the last year, just traded a new all-time high today. Allstate, same same thing, making new relative strength highs and new absolute price highs as, as uh, premiums 
in auto insurance and, and property and casualty insurance continue to be very firm. So really positive on financials. And the reason I bring this up each week is remember in the all world index, you know, this is like 22% of the all world index versus about 11% in the S and P in the Canadian market, it's 31% financials. So it shouldn't be a surprise that it's taken a long time for the Canadian market to make new highs. Uh, in, in Japan, very significant concentration in financial services and trading companies. So this is the last five months, one, two, three, four, five up months. Uh, financials continue to look very strong, the insurance sector in particular. Big banks since the October low of 2022 outperforming regional banks which would make sense given the fact that the regional banks tend to have much more real estate exposure, particularly the commercial real estate. So JP Morgan continues to, to march along and, and uh, so does Citigroup, so does Bank of America. Uh, industrials, they've been leadership uh, pretty steadily since October. They continue to be uh, materials uh, on a 10 week uh, winning streak, really behaving better than virtually all sectors over the last two months. Uh, and uh, getting breakouts in copper stocks um, like Freeport McMoran, long period of consolidation, bear market from 2011 to 2021, tightening consolidation range during the Fed's tightening cycle, blasting off over the last few weeks. Tech resources is a similar picture. Capstone mining uh, in the mid cap, it's about a $6 billion company. You know, you look at strong, sharply rising relative strength. Now, <clears throat> they're moving higher and they're doing well. But to be clear, they've gone through a gestation period that's a decade long. So just because they've started to rally does not mean it's over. It means it's the beginning of something. We think that there's a long way that these stocks can go. <clears throat> and for good reason. When a sector goes through a bear market and share prices don't go up, board of directors don't like it very much. And certainly shareholders don't either. So board of directors say to CEOs, stop spending money. We don't want you throwing money into the ground if we're not going to make money. So look at the number of major copper fines per year going back to 2008. If you're not spending money, you're probably not finding copper. And if we wind up with a deficit, you wonder where the new copper is going to come from. That means prices can go higher. Uranium, after a few weeks of consolidation, turned back higher this week. Goldman Sachs found some religion and, and recommended Cameco as a way to invest in the, in the clean energy that can come from uranium. So he had a sharply higher stock price uh, yesterday and today. Uh, this, is, these are, this is a weekly bar. Again, <clears throat> after many years of underperformance, the fact that it's strengthened, that probably doesn't mean it's over. It probably means it's just beginning. Uh, in the gold sector, we've talked about Agnico, we've talked about uh, Iago, we've talked about Alamos Gold, and Alamos Gold today trading at a new 10-year <clears throat> uh, high. So most many gold producers have suffered with higher costs and, and as a result have had weak share prices. There's a few that have some interesting prospects uh, and uh, interesting new production coming on that are performing better than the rest. We think we're focused on some good ones. Uh, we think that Agnico Eagle is one that is you know, the one that is most likely be purchased by U.S. institutional investors. Uh, and it's a strong cash flow growth uh, company. Um, outside of uh, uh, the other groups, we still think the aggregates look quite attractive. These are basically building materials used in making concrete. Um, and energy, same thing. Energy over the last number of weeks really breaking out. And we're just finally really exceeding the highs from early 2022. And we're seeing strength in companies like Canadian Natural Resources, which will grow its dividend probably 20% a year for the next five years. Um, Imperial Oil, <clears throat> you know, up sharply today against a weak market. Well, you know, there's a 3% uh, dividend. Um, dividend growth of the last 10 quarters has averaged 21%. So if we think that we wanna own income that will rise if there is inflation, these are companies that can provide that. And for those that think that oil will go away as a, a source of energy, the truth is, and we put this up a few months ago, 
there is no source of energy that has ever really gone away. We add additional sources on top, but we're a long, long way from getting off oil. So <clears throat> we think that a long, stable supply in the ground that's been invested in where the capacity is there to produce, you know, is a pretty attractive asset. And the new Trans Mountain Pipeline, uh, uh, it turns out, a bunch of Canadian oil is being taken by tanker from BC down to the ports in LA. And there's been a big uh, increase in their demand for Canadian oil since that pipeline is open, opening up. Changes. <clears throat> Technology is waning from a relative strength perspective. And I always like to overlay price behavior against how people are positioned. So I think this is an important chart. Year-to-date flows into equity funds by sector. Pretty clearly, everybody is focusing on technology, and for good reason. You know, AI is going to be a very important area, and we can't have AI without NVIDIA chips. Uh, Microsoft is going to be a big beneficiary. But it's not unknown, and people have been aggressively positioning in those areas. On the other hand, you know, energy has seen money flow out all year long. Financials have seen money flow out. Well, we've just looked at how these things are doing. They're performing really well. And if they're under-owned, it means that people ultimately may have to chase. Groups that have been weak continue to be weak. Healthcare, relative strength, continues to weaken. We talked about this last week. You can often have a share price that's going higher, which looks good on paper. But if it's underperforming the market, when the market has a downturn, you know, it can take it on the chin. And so we saw real weakness today in healthcare. We saw real weakness today in consumer discretionary. We saw real weakness in consumer staples. We saw real weakness in telecom breaking the lows from the last few weeks. These are things that we've been avoiding. Real estate, you know, first sign of weakness, you know, making relative strength new lows. So it doesn't look like there's a lot changing. <clears throat> there is one area that we would highlight that may be going through a change. There are a number of reports that have come out over the last couple of weeks talking about the demand for electricity uh, in a world where we're building large data centers to do machine learning uh, inference models. Um, there's going to be a lot of money spent building highly energy intensive facilities also for semiconductor manufacturing. So we have seen a turn both in breadth and in relative strength in utilities. This is a higher dividending group, a dividend paying group with, it has had lower uh, dividend growth, but we note it. And so in our macro portfolio and in our equity portfolio, we added, I think a 2% weight to utilities this week. We'll see whether it plays out. Uh, but we're just marginally making a higher high than we made in January. Relative strength is firming up. So we'll see uh, to be continued. So when we look at <clears throat> the universe of ETFs, there's about uh, 2,500 that trade in North America. There are a handful that have shown steadily improving relative strength. And you can see what they are. There's energy, there's copper. Um, there's energy infrastructure. Uh, there's a bunch of global markets, MSCI Value Global, uh, Europe, uh, Japan, the industrial sector, the material sector. As long as these continue to behave this way, we want to own these things. Uh, we watch for changes every week. But as it turns out, you know, we continue to be significantly overweight financials. Uh, we continue to be about a half weight in technology. That's been coming down, as most people know, over the last number of months. Industrials is a significant overweight. Materials is a significant overweight. Energy is an overweight. And then these other groups that we just talked about, healthcare, staples, discretionary, <clears throat> communication services, real estate, uh, underweight. <clears throat> I do mention that uh, our global exposure is driven largely by the fact that we have larger components in financials, industrials, uh, energy, and real estate. And then when we look at things that could knock us off our game, 
credit markets continue to see narrowing credit spreads. We think that's positive. In fact, since rates bottomed in the early part of 2020, high yield or junk bonds have been outperforming high grade investment grade bonds. So that tells you that we don't think there's some big credit event out there if high yield bonds are outperforming investment grade. Volatility is up a little bit this week, but solidly in the range that we tend to be in during the best uh, cyclical bull markets. And so as we sort of wrap today, I just come back to this chart. <clears throat> We're three months into what likely will be, you know, two years or two and a half years or three years before we get the next significant, you know, economic cyclical low. Um, we'll see. Things can change. But as you can see, the market internals are supportive. There's some clear leadership in the market. We're seeing a broadening in the equity asset class. Uh, and I think that we're positioned for it. So with that, Pamela, if there's any questions, you know, certainly we are happy to answer them. Thank you, David. Our first question comes from Alejandro. He says, uh, David, do you think that the nuclear energy industry in this moment is expensive or is it just starting a long term bull cycle? You have mentioned in the past stocks like BWXT or Cameco. Would you put money to work in this industry at this moment? Yeah, fair question. Um, yes, is the answer. Um, you know, BWX continues to be a holding for us. Um, I think that it looks really attractive. Let me just see if I can throw something up here. BWX technology. <clears throat> so this is 2018. Uh, this is 2021 group broke out you know we've had one two three four five weeks of consolidation you know solidly uh, supported um, bwx is is a company that uh, manages uh, and services small modular reactors for the navy they they put their first nuclear reactor in a merchant ship in 1957 they work with ontario power generation on the on the nuclear power plants in in uh, ontario uh, and a number of companies have now said that they would like to commercially build small nuclear reactors to power things like <clears throat> uh, cloud uh, data centers. So we do like the sector. Um, remember that when you start to see strength in uranium prices, uh, it can take a long time for new production to come on. Uh, so here's uranium prices. Uh, this is the U.UN, which is the unit that holds physical uranium, the Sprott physical uranium units. So, you know, they broke out in 2023 in August. They recently pulled back, as we were just talking about a minute ago, um, but they've turned higher this week. You know, there's no new production really coming on of any size whatsoever. Probably the most likely one to come on at some point. Uh, is Next Gen Energy, which is a Canadian company. Um, it's uh, uh, in Saskatchewan and a very significant resource, uh, but it's a development company. There's lots of risks with that. Uh, we own some of this. Uh, I own some personally. <clears throat> uh, I think I think that the uranium uh, theme is something that will go on for some time. But there's risks and like like in anything, we got to continue to watch it and make sure that it continues to unfold the right way. Thank you, David. The next question uh, comes from an anonymous uh, viewer and they ask uh, or, or state rather, I was stopped out of my insurance and telecom positions this week. I am overweight in energy stocks and Canadian financials. What dividend growers would you recommend for a new position this week? Well, great question. I mean, you know, one one way you can go is you can buy a basket, you know, buy the RDBY ETF. I think that's interesting. Um, certainly our tactical income fund is chock full of them. Uh, that's another way you can do it. Um, I think that you can look uh, um, within uh, the large U.S. money center banks, uh, like a city group. Um, you know, we talked recently about JP Morgan, like they've raised their dividend twice this year, raised it 15%. Um, I, I think that you could look at, um, 
There's an ETF GUNR, which is made up of upstream commodity producers. That way you don't take any business risk, but you can get a, a pretty sizable dividend uh, that will grow uh, from a basket of, of commodity producers, both energy and, and, and materials companies. Um, and I would look at some of the industrials, you know, uh, uh, perhaps one of the railroads uh, might might be worth looking at uh, CP, for instance. But there's there you know there's a bunch of things. Um, we we post our holdings in our tactical income portfolio every week. You know, for the folks that subscribe to our stuff, you're happy to browse through that list. The only thing is, you have to know when to enter and exit. Thanks, Dave. The next question again, an anonymous uh, viewer asking, uh, David, you've talked about mining stocks and momentum and commodity pricing. Do you see any opportunities that fit the income portfolio model? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the things that the things that we're talking about, I mean, you know, um, uh, Canadian natural resources, I think, is a is could could be in any portfolio, high, high quality company, high quality assets. Um, Again, same thing, you know, give us your, give us your contact information. If you want to get it, we do send out the holdings in our tactical income portfolio. It's not a million names. It's like 25 names um, and it is actively managed. Uh, but that basket, I think the, the dividend growth in the portfolio last year was 14%. Um, and uh, I would expect it to be there or higher this year. So there's, there's lots of things to do in this area. Thanks, Dave. That concludes the questions we, we have received this afternoon. So as always, I leave you with the final word. Look, um, you know, it's it's spring. Uh, we're in an election year. Uh, it tends to be that the closer to the election we get, things, things get a little bit more clear. Um, seasonally, markets should be, you know, positive through into kind of July. Um, like I said, we can get corrections anytime geopolitical risks are out there. Um, uh, but at this point, I think that there are more people underinvested than there are overinvested. And so it is likely in the near term that uh, dips will be purchased. And uh, there's a lot of very clear uptrends in the market. Um, you know, some of those stocks could pull back and stay within their uptrends and be great entry points. Um, but uh, I, try, I try not to get too cute right now. Um, and um, the fact that the defensive stocks, high dividend pairs with no growth, are as crowded as they are and have performed as poorly as they have means likely you're going to see some people capitulate on those. So I wouldn't be in a hurry to chase that, that, that part of the market. Um, and we'll talk again next week. Thanks everyone for uh, for joining. If you if you uh, want to ask us some questions during the week, don't hesitate to reach out. We're always available. And um, uh, if you want us to talk about something next week, you know, shoot it into us, and we'll try and make sure we address it. Appreciate everybody spending the time with us. Thanks so much. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you.